All right, so we're going to transition here to the message. So we are on the last week of our series, Be Transformed. And so this is where we want as a church to come together and practically um, have a vision together of how we can follow Jesus. And so we're in Romans chapter 12, where Paul has asked, uh, has urged the church to respond to the gospel. And so for 11 chapters, Paul unpacks the condition of humankind, that we are under the judgment of God because of sin, and we can't overcome that on our own, but God has given us the gift of eternal life in Jesus that is through faith. So by believing in who Jesus is, we gain all the benefits of eternal life. And so in chapter 12, he says, do you know what it means to live out that faith? What faith really means is it means to respond to God in worship. Respond to God in worship, but that doesn't, what we understand is that worship is not simply singing songs to God, although that's a wonderful part of it. It's actually fundamentally to live a life pleasing to God. That is that we orient our minds and our bodies in, uh, around who God is and who he calls us to be. Our, we orient our minds and our bodies. That is worship. In other words, worship is saying to God that he is worthy of my life's devotion. He is worthy of my life's devotion. That is ascribing to God his worth. And that is worship. But worship also ascribes to us our worth. Because we say, I will devote my life to nothing less than God himself. Paul says in Romans 3 that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Sin is settling. Sin is living for less than you were designed for. So worship is living into our, the fullness of our worth. That we will worship nothing less than God himself. And so what that means is that when we believe in Jesus, we say that we will follow God through the commands of Christ in all the areas of our life. Our, and our minds and bodies now are going to come into alignment with that. And so the good thing about that is as soon as we do that, guess what we discover is that Jesus teaches us a lot about love. He teaches us what it really means to be loving. And so we saw in this passage that we want love to be genuine. That's what we talked last week. Let love be genuine, which means there are counterfeit loves out there. So for us to follow God and submit our lives to him in worship, we're going to need to listen to him about what it means to love and to be loving and to not fall for a fake. Now, I made, um, last week, I made eight statements about the nature of love. I'm sure you all remember them. But there's one more statement to make. We have to make one more statement about the nature of of genuine love. And I would say this last statement is the real acid test of our love. Now, when I wrote that, I realized I didn't know what an acid test was. I know what it means, like when you say it, but I'm like, what? why do we say this phrase? And so I looked it up. And what you see here is that is gold on top of this black stone. It's a special stone. I can't remember what it's called. And the idea is to test if the gold is real, you scrape the gold onto this stone so you see it, and then you put the acid on it. And if the acid dissolves the gold, it's not gold. It made it disappear. But gold can withstand acid because it's, a, um, it's like a pure metal. Someone help me out. What? No, you guys are all wrong. 
it's a special kind of metal that doesn't dissolve in acid. Okay. <laughs> and so that's how you know it's pure. And so when we talk about genuine love and that there are no counterfeits, Jesus is saying, if you want to love, you need to be perfect like your father. You need to love like your father. And what he says is the true test is, do you love your enemies? Do you love people who mistreat you? And Jesus says, you know what? The tax collectors and the Gentiles, they love people who love them. You're no different if that's all you do. The real test is, what about when you face evil? When you face mistreatment, that's the acid that comes upon you. And the question is, does it dissolve your love? Then it wasn't real. And so God calls us to worship him, to follow him by living out a life of genuine love and the real test for the believer is what happens. What do you do when you face evil and mistreatment? So I came to this passage myself realizing that this is probably one of my greatest struggles. Is dealing with my own reaction to mistreatment, my own anger response. And so I actually had some really painful I went through a really painful season with my extended family um, where we weren't speaking to each other for years and I was very angry. I went to counseling for this. I've been to counseling twice for two different sessions for the same reason, for anger over mistreatment. And so I come to this passage being like, man, I need this too. This is a huge struggle. And what I found from Paul is he's going to give us three motivations to help us respond rightly to mistreatment so that we could be worshipers of God. <clears throat> and so what we're going to see is that there, when we face mistreatment, there is an opportunity we need to embrace. There are resources, resources of faith that we have to dig into, and there is a victory we can anticipate. <clears throat> so the first motivation Paul gives us is facing mistreatment is an opportunity to display our faith. Verse 17. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Repay no one evil for evil. You know, sometimes that word evil may be, feel too strong for us. And we're not sure how to process that word. We're aware that Christians have faced evil throughout the centuries. For example, they were persecuted in horrible ways in the, uh, in Rome, in the Roman, under the Roman rule. They were burned at the stake. They were fed to lions. That's evil. We also are aware that human beings have experienced degrees of oppression and slavery and um, inhumane treatment that is really evil. And so some of us may say, well, I don't really experience, I don't really experience evil, but actually Jesus is gonna say that when you are angry, you are going to face a huge spiritual test. That anger itself over even quote unquote smaller things is a huge crossroads for you. If you hold on to your anger, Jesus says, then you risk the same judgment as if you had committed murder. And if you actually pour out a word of revilement to somebody who hurt you because of your anger, then you risk the judgment of hell. So it's a serious thing for Christians to know how to navigate mistreatment from all levels, from the worst of the worst to the everyday kinds of mistreatment we experience from our family, which I've been there, from workplace, in the church even, persecution, so being reviled for your faith. So this is something for all Christians to understand that you are going, this is going to be a regular part of our life. 
And we're going to have to know how to handle that. And so we need a right response. And Paul says the right response is don't repay evil for evil. And that what he says is do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, as far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. So isn't that interesting what Paul draws your attention to when you face mistreatment as a believer? Do what is honorable in the sight of all. He wants you to be thinking about the facts that when you face mistreatment, there are eyes on you. When you face mistreatment, guess what? You now have a captive audience. Have you ever wondered how to help somebody understand the gospel who is apathetic or hostile to it? You just can't get through. Well, when you face mistreatment, I promise you they're paying attention. How we respond when we are mistreated leaves the strongest impression. And so Paul says, I want you to give thought to that. And so the idea here is that God wants us to raise a faithful witness. You know what that word witness in the Greek is? Someone yell it to me, you know. Martyr. Martyr. Did Jesus not say, I send you as sheep among wolves? That's part of how he witnesses to the world is sending you out to face mistreatment. And so when you face evil, just to sneak in some theology here, God wants you to think about what is he doing? What is his sovereign plan? How is he at work? Jesus said something interesting about the way he described his crucifixion. He, used, he would say, when the Son of Man is glorified, when the Son of God is glorified, that's how he would describe what was happening when he was going to suffer abuse, die, and rise again. The glory of God is being revealed. And we learn what that means, especially when we go to when, uh, uh, Peter, 1 Peter chapter 3, you can read it. Peter says, Jesus is our example of how to handle suffering. He is our example. Because when he suffered, he did not revile. And instead, he went to the cross and died for us. By his wounds, we, who are his enemies, are healed. And brought to the overseer of our soul. By Jesus' suffering. So, what does it mean to witness to the glory of God? Is when we suffer and respond rightly, we are pointing people to the one who suffered for sinners. Like that person, like yourself. That's the target. That's the glory of God. The glory of God is revealed when someone righteous who is righteous or has not done wrong suffers for the good of the other person and does what is right. That is pointing people to the God that saves sinners. So God wants you to have that in mind that maybe when you suffer, maybe when you face mistreatment, he's raising you up to be a witness in that moment to who he is. Give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. You have a captive audience. As much as you can, as much as possible, try to do what leads to peace. I appreciate the caveat of as much as it depends on you, because sometimes it's gonna get a little messy and may not be peaceful, but that's how you're thinking. So what does that mean? Just for example, what does it mean to do what is honorable? Let's, lose, let's use Jesus' example. Go through this quickly here. First thing we see Jesus does in the face of mistreatment is he's silent. He does not react with revilement. He absorbs it. He's quiet. In fact, it frustrates the religious leaders and the civil authorities. He just does not respond. So sometimes when facing mistreatment, the best way to do what is honorable is to just absorb it, to be quiet. 
But we also see that Jesus will speak the truth in love. At one point, one of the scenes where he's being on trial with the Sanhedrin or with the the Pharisees, he says something and then someone slaps him. And Jesus says, if what I said is wrong, bear witness about the wrong. But if what I said is right, why do you strike me? So he reasonably says, what are you, why did you do that? Here, and he, it just speaks the truth and confronts it, but does not revile him. Martin Luther King also gave us a great example of this in the civil rights movement, where there, he addressed, and, 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 and many people rose up and addressed the wrong that was done, but he left us, example, he, he left us an example of doing that in a way of love. And so he addressed it. He says, in America, we should be judged by the content of our character, not the color of our skin. What a penetrating statement that he could have made, that he made. He could have said all kinds of horrible things about how racist America is. I'm sure he felt that way. But instead, he appealed to our conscience. And so it is good and necessary to be forceful in what we say sometimes. But let us take off the punishing edge of insult of revilement, of an inattention to nuance and hurtful generalities that characterize our current political discourse, by the way, that characterize the way a lot of us interact on the internet when we're behind a screen. So speak the truth in love. The other thing we see Jesus do is he prays. Father, forgive them. They know what, not what they do. When he's being crucified, he prays for them. We saw in the previous passage, bless those who, who persecute you, do not curse. Pray for them out of compassion. We can do acts of kindness. We're gonna see that Jesus washes the feet of his disciples, including Judas, who betrayed him. He fed Peter after Peter denied him. We can leave it to the governing authorities. So there are proper authorities in place when we face mistreatment that can be appealed to and let them do the work of enacting justice. And I think it means we need to avoid some things. These are things to do. We should avoid some things. And I just kind of thought of these as more everyday reactions to evil that we need to avoid. Number one is verbal whippings, angry outbursts of revilements. So this could, you know, I'm going to speak to parents on this one, towards your kids, towards your spouse. People we're really close to, when we get angry, man, we can unload and unleash revilement. Um, But other situations as well, verbal whippings should be avoided. Silent assassinating, cold shoulder, passive aggressive. It's gonna make, I'm just gonna hurt you by withholding love and affection. Relational murder where you just cut the person out. And lastly, reputation sabotage. You gossip. You're just going to make sure everyone knows what this person did. So I think we want to avoid these as not honorable. And so let us again raise a faithful witness to the glory of the Son of God who suffered for sinners and led them to their Father. And we give a witness to that when we suffer rightly. But what do we do with our anger? What do we do with our need for justice? So Paul's gonna give us some more resources to handle our own anger. So responding rightly to mistreatment requires the resources of faith. We need to see the opportunity. I hope that's motivating to us and encouraging us. But we, there's more resources Paul taps into. He says, beloved, Never avenge yourself, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. So when we face mistreatment, we need to believe in God in that moment. And I think there's two things, I see two nuances to what Paul's saying here. One is we need to believe that uh, punishment is not our job. It is God's. It is his prerogative. 
And Paul knows this is hard, so he's going to say, remember you are beloved. He draws us in, let us feel our belovedness of God. God is saying, beloved, I got this. This is not your role. You're not equipped for this. Do not trust your heart to handle justice rightly. Trust me. I was thinking about how, you know, think about, uh, this happens in our family from time to time. We have an errant child, and we need to correct them. Mom and dad are handling it, and another child walks in with righteous judgment while we're handling it. Not your lane. Stay out of it. That's kind of what God is saying. I, this is my lane, not yours. And then he also is saying, you need to believe that God will do it. You have to believe that God is alive and is working justice in the world and will bring final justice to all wrongdoing. You have to believe that. I was thinking about Batman and why he exists in Gotham City. What is he doing? Why is he a vigilante, right? What we're seeing from Paul is no vigilante justice. Well, Batman's problem is there's no justice in Gotham, right? The criminals, you know, the police are in the pocket of the criminals. The, there's no prosecution. So he's like, that's it. I'm taking matters into my own fists. And we love it. We soak it up. But remember, in, in, in Christopher, Nol- Christopher Nolan, uh, his version Bruce Wayne is rooting for Harvey Dent to be the DA who will finally prosecute evil so that he doesn't have to be Batman, right? So his problem is there is no justice. He wants justice, but there is no justice. So when we take vengeance, we are saying, when we repay evil for evil, we are saying God does not see. God does, will not enact justice. He is not strong enough to handle it. It's to deny the gospel itself. When we believe the gospel, when we believe in Jesus, we believe in a very important thing, that he rose from the dead. That God rose from the dead. But you know what you're believing when you believe that? You're not just believing a fact. You're believing in a future. Listen to what Paul says to the Athenians He says, because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness. He's going to judge. He's going to do it. By a man whom he appointed. And he has given assurance or proof by raising him from the dead. To believe in Jesus is to believe that there is going to be a resurrection to judgment. That is the point of resurrection. That is the point. Death is no escape. The resurrection is coming and justice will be done by God through Jesus. And so we are to believe in that and we're to believe that God is working now. God has said, and we're going to study this in a few weeks, that he does institute the governing authorities to enact justice, although imperfectly. So part of faith is trusting that God works through imperfect institutions and you will have to leave it to that even when sometimes it fails. But hey, we're Christians. We should be very good at trusting imperfect institutions. The church, hello. So that's part of our journey together is believing that God works through imperfect institutions but will bring the perfect. So let, when to act rightly, we have to believe by faith in God's role in all this and leave it to him in this world and the next. But I think there's one more motivation Paul gives us. There's a victory that we can anticipate. Anyone competitive out there? Anyone want to win? Well, Paul taps into that motivation here as well. He says we need to, be, we need to overcome evil Overcome, that's the word Nike. That's the word for victory. So there's a victory we need to have in the moment. When you face evil, 
Paul says it's like you're in the ring. And someone is coming for you. You can't just lay down and take it. Uh Uh-uh. You have to overcome. You're going to have to fight. So when you face evil, you are in a battle. But there's two parallel tracks you can take. You can overcome that evil by punishing it. And God says, that's evil. That's not for Christians. It's not for us. It's not our path. But there is a way you can overcome it. There is something you can do. And Paul says that you, will, you can heap burning coals on their head. So right, when someone hurts you, you want to hurt them back. But Paul says there's a bad way to do it and there's a good way to bring hurt on that person. It's through kindness. Kindness heaps burning coals on their head. In other words, it's a good kind of hurt because it goes right into their conscience. It gets right into their mind and hurts them where it can help them. In their conscience, that will, can lead to actual change when they see your good deeds in the midst of what you've done. That's the most powerful impression you can make. And so I was thinking about um, Daniel Snyder's Superman movie. Total coincidence that I have a Batman and a Superman analogy. Just worked. In Daniel Snyder's Superman, remember the Justice League? You got to watch the Snyder Cut, by the way. Don't even try the other one. But there's this really interest, really good scene, fun scene, exciting scene, um, where you know the Justice League, they have to resurrect Clark Kent, Superman. He died in the other one. Yeah, sorry. And they have to resurrect him because they need him to help him fight the main enemy. The main bad guy is a really bad, tough dude. They need Superman, but he's dead. They got to resurrect him. Well, when they resurrect him, there's a problem. He's like a mindless Kryptonian and everybody's just a threat and he just starts fighting them and beating them up. And so they're fighting him in response. They're like, boom, they're just fighting. It's not working. I mean, they just cannot handle him. They're just, the more they fight, the angrier he gets until Lois shows up. Lois Lane, I tried my best to do a screenshot here, and she just appeals to him, and with tears, is like, Clark, stop, and he hugs her, and as he hugs her, he remembers who he is. He remembers that he loves her, that he loves humanity. He's not a mindless Kryptonian, he's Clark Kent, and he joins the team, and you can watch the rest. I won't spoil the rest. So what Paul is saying here is that when you do good and kindness to your enemy, you can help them wake up to who they are, to their real humanity, that they are actually loved by you because they are loved by their heavenly father. And Jesus says, you know what? My sheep hear my voice, my lost sheep. The ones who are out there wreaking havoc, but when I call them, they will recognize me. And you know how they're going to recognize Jesus is through your deeds? Maybe when you do good, they're going to hear their shepherd, their true shepherd. And maybe you will win them over to the team. You know, in this last statement, Paul says, Do not be overcome by evil. Overcome evil with good. I see him, you know, the person who hurt you kind of disappears from the scene. And he's saying, this is about the fight between good and evil. That's what's actually going on. And so he's saying that, you know what? It's not about that person who hurt you. It's not about them. Paul says it elsewhere, our wrestling, our fighting is not with flesh and blood. Remember that? It is not with flesh and blood. It's with the principalities of power. Satan is after us when we face mistreatment. And what happens is when we do good, In the face of evil, we get the victory. 
When we do good in the face of evil, we point to the one who has overcome. We point to the one who will overcome evil once and for all. We foreshadow that when we overcome in that moment. We give a whisper and a foreshadowing of the one who is coming and we say to that person, I have overcome because he has overcome for me. He lives in me. He's gonna come again. Won't you come and meet him? It is our desire here at Solano that many would come and be baptized and experience new life with Jesus. We would love to see that happen. We would love God to do that. But how is that gonna happen? How are we going to help people meet Jesus? How are we gonna do that? I'm gonna tell you what's not. Solano, we're gonna hit our 20 year anniversary this year as a church. Here in the East Bay, in the Bay Area, what a beautiful thing that God has done to allow Solano to remain faithful to the gospel over that time. And you know what it's been about? It's not been about grandiose worship services, as good as our worship is. It's not what it's about. It's not about celebrity preachers or a fancy building. It's because of disciples of Jesus living transformed lives. Serving one another, amen. Serving one another, loving one another with humility and raising a faithful witness to a watching world when we suffer. They're not paying attention in else time, but when we suffer, how we respond. What a witness. We're gonna enter a time of prayer today, Solano. And this is gonna close out our series where we want to be transformed. And I hope you have felt encouraged and challenged because the call to be transformed is a beautiful thing, but an impossible thing. And I have to imagine that all of us are facing huge barriers in our own heart and souls to being transformed, to presenting our bodies as living sacrifices, to being transformed in our minds, to using our gifts with zeal and energy and purpose and courage, to loving one another in all humility and gentleness and affection. And, to, and I'm sure what a struggle it is to face mistreatment. Solano, you know what that, that means? We need prayer. So would you really pray about coming up? No, I don't know, just come up. You don't even need to pray about it. We're gonna have people up front get prayer about how God can help you be transformed. And so think of it this way. Pray for God to help you put away anger in the face of mistreatment so you can do good to overcome evil. Pray for God to help you overcome fear and live with purpose in your giftings. Maybe it's to discover what your giftings are. Maybe it's to understand how and where to use them. Maybe it's to know how to steward them better. And pray for God to help starve your pride and love someone near with you, near to you with genuine love. Never be wise in your own eyes. So if you're someone that needs help with anger or pride or fear, there's some hard things going on in your life, there's some barriers in your life, come and receive prayer this morning.